different style uh, for setting us up. And welcome everyone to um, today's session, which we say is a special session. And unlike previous sessions where uh, we did a lot of slide, uh, this today I'm, I, I would like to just talk to you from the heart um, for you to understand where we are um, in line with what we set up to do. And for some of you who are thinking of starting an initiative, maybe um, it would also help you to see some of the issues that are in the way. So once again, good morning, welcome. And uh, at the end of it, I look forward to um, some questions because I actually tend to function better when I'm reacting to questions from an audience. So, um, like Dyer said, this is the 17th American Aware Cerebral Palsy Awareness Day. Uh, cerebral palsy has been around for more than 30 years, but sometime about after about five years of research and discovery, when um, two important things came out, the fact that cerebral palsy is not infectious and it's not uh, contagious, meaning that anybody who has cerebral palsy will be left to their own devices there wouldn't really be much of a problem to anybody else. Um, funding for research into cerebral palsy dried up. And for about 25 years, um, yes, there was some support from the American government and uh, in terms of maybe therapy, payment for therapy, assistive devices, and so on. Um, the real uh, issue of taking it forward was not happening because funding was not made available from government for people to do research. But as some families started to see the progress being made in the area of autism, um, a particular family, a woman whose daughter was 14 years old at that time, with an NGO called Reaching for the Stars America, started an online campaign to raise 5,000 signatures and um, to take to the American Congress. And that was just within two years that Benola had started um, working on uh, this idea. And so even though they've been celebrating cerebral palsy awareness in some states, it was when she finally took that signature, 5,000 signatures, and Benola was one of those who signed, we signed the signature online, and she took to Congress that the American government officially uh, recognized Cerebral Policy Awareness Day and released, started releasing funding for further research into cerebral policy, which is going on now. And um, even at the end of the day, she sent Benola um, a letter of appreciation for signing that document. We moved on and continued to do our own work. And um, because of, we are every four years since we started, once it gets to the year of the election, we found that it's not the appropriate time to do anything in terms of the celebration because it just clashes with the week of uh, election. So again, this year, which should have been a major milestone, or which is a major milestone for Benola, our 10th year of being out there, uh, we decided to just mark it low key with just some online social media work. Um, and so, so I will just move on to say now that Laulu, our son, was, was born on the 14th of June, 1996. And it took us pretty much a year to confirm that what he had was cerebral palsy. 
even though we had seen a doctor by December uh, who had told us it was cerebral palsy, but it still took my wife traveling to Germany, uh, seeing specialists and so on for staying for like three to four months uh, before they came back. And then it was clear that, first of all, um, cerebral palsy had no cure. But secondly, he would have to grow for a few more years before one could tell how badly affected he would be by cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. uh, my job as a military officer living away from home was such that for the first 12 years of his life, I was only home on occasional weekends. I remember 2011 during the, uh, no, it was, sorry, uh, 2003 or so during the elections. I was not, I couldn't even get to Lagos for over six months because they wouldn't just give me a pass. And we didn't have um, mobile phones then. So it was a bit of a problem keeping in touch with my wife. Um, but somehow he went on. We were able to take him to England in 2006, where he spent close to three years um, getting what we well, call the best of medical care. Uh, he had been in the system. He had uh, received from bed to wheelchair to medications to diapers, all being delivered to the house free. But when I retired in 2008, my wife decided that she needed to come back home because of two things. Lalu had developed scoliosis, which is a twisting of the spine. And um, to, to perform the necessary surgery on him, the British Medical Services said he would have to be placed in a coma for three months until he got better and so on. It was a bit of a complicated issue. Plus, yeah, I was going to be in Nigeria alone, retired and so on. So we took a decision. We brought him back home. And subsequently, with friends, we started looking at the option of going to uh, India, which we were able to do in 2010. And um, it was quite an experience. I was on, I, I was a pensioner, so to speak. So I was able to stay with them in the hospital for the entire period. Um, they weren't even going to do the surgery because he was nonverbal. And uh, everybody they had been doing scoliosis surgery on could speak because it was a very delicate surgery. But at the end of the day, because I was there in the hospital, because he, one thing led to another, and because I made it clear to the doctors that taking him through Dubai to Bangalore, India, was a, was a very stressful experience for both of us, me and my wife. Uh, that I didn't think that if we took him home, I'll bring him again. Uh, so one day they just came and said, well, they are discussed, and since we were ready, they'll go for it. It was an expensive ex surgery, but again, friends had rallied around, we had enough money, and we did it. Um, at the end of the day, um, I'll say that we learned a lot. Now lose life the quality of life improved, but it's not as if he could still sit on his own or need it. It was not as if he could do one or two things. In fact, years later, you'll find that he still has a twisting of the spinal cord, uh, partly because in the first three, four years after the surgery, we didn't have the right support system in terms of a chair and so on, like the chair he's using today. So I, I, I have learned a lot about uh, taking care of a child like this. And like I said, 12 years away from home, I decided on retirement that I wanted to be near home. But I have been a teacher. I taught people in classrooms. I taught people how to fly airplanes. And I always used to tell people that um, I'm an honorary member of the Nigerian Teachers Association. I love nothing better than to speak and to try to explain things to people. Um, I'm one of those people who very early in my life decided that I didn't want complex language. Um, so I don't blow grammar as most people would expect me to. 
I speak in very simple language because I learned that if you speak and people do not understand you, um, you are not achieving the best of results. So um, when a friend of mine came up with the idea of us starting an NGO, the idea was really about maybe climate change or something that would bring money. But I explained about disability. And uh, in 2012, October, a decision was taken that we do cerebral palsy. In fact, at first, I told this gentleman, I said, look, 15 years managing a child, what do I do? What else is there to know about cerebral palsy? And being a medical doctor himself, he just laughed. And he said, look, Avian, if you have headache, you are looking at headache. Even if you go online and you Google it. But if you really want to study headache, you'll be amazed at the various forms of headache and the causes and management and the cures. He said, and that's what you'll discover if you decide to go online to study cerebral palsy. Um, and I'll tell you that in the first weekend after that conversation, I was shocked at the amount of information available on cerebral palsy. I was shocked at the number of NGOs all over the world, particularly in America and Australia, that are doing cerebral palsy. And um, so that's how we started. And then to get a name. Um, you see, having traveled around now, you see, if you have a child with a disability, you will see things that most people will not see as you travel, as you move around town and so on. Even when you encounter beggars on the side of the road. And so um, we had seen a lot. We are, my wife, for more than eight years, had made it a regular point of duty to visit homes, not just homes for special children, but even old people's homes and all, to make donations, uh, both financial and um, you know, in kind. And so we had an agreement that, look, the problem here is not lack of homes or schools. The problem is a lack of understanding by the general public and also the parents themselves, basically a lack of awareness. And so uh, with my background and exposure and house, if we were going to not just set up another home or try to set up a school, I don't think we would reach or help people. We would not be changing the mindset which we need to change in our children. Because you see, as of December 2012, um, some TV stations and some newspapers were writing articles about terrible policy, but they didn't have the picture of a Nigerian child. It was always some white child and so on. So when we started, um, we walked from that October till February 26th, when we had the first official presentation of Benola. And by then I'd made up my mind with my wife that what we were just going to stick to is advocacy, raise awareness, um, you know, provide information, maybe some counseling to parents and so on. And so we built our own capacity. We did a couple of workshops, in fact, three major workshops where we funded um, experts from various Nigerian universities, from Amadubili University to uh, Cardinal Polytechnic, University of Nigeria and Suka, uh, University of Calabar, University of Jos. They all came to Lagos. Uh, we would house them for like two nights. Uh, we would walk from morning to night in a typical workshop kind of environment. And uh, at our first workshop, I remember the professor from the University of uh, of Joss, who said he was amazed that somebody was putting together such a workshop because in the university, they work in silos. Those working on one kind of heart, on maybe um, trauma, or so on and so forth, they continue to do their individual conferences. But there was no, there'd never been a time when somebody brought different experts together. And uh, I remember a particular professor at the University of Lagos who was invited and he refused because he didn't know who Benola was. 
And uh, luckily, a few months, maybe a few months later, there was a workshop on cerebral palsy where he was the kidney speaker. And my wife showed up. And when she introduced herself, he said, oh, really? You are the people. And uh, he now promised to um, attend any other thing we were doing. And to the glory of God, he's today the chairman of the NOLA's advisory board. So what has happened over the years has been a situation where we continue to try to push the envelope. And what we thought we needed to do was to come up with a roadmap for cerebral palsy management um, in the first, um, well, I say the first 24, uh, within the first 18 months of starting Benola. So all our workshops were geared towards understanding CP and then understanding how parents interacted with CP, uh, which is why we started the family forum. And even everything we do till today is to try and get parents to open up. Because if I'm going to speak, or Benola is going to speak on behalf of Nigerian or African parents, we cannot continuously speak from our own, only our own experience of cerebral palsy. We must get inputs from parents. We must see people's children. Uh, we must hear genuinely how they are affected. And so we were able to come out with a book, a publication which we call Benola Roadmap for Cerebral Palsy Management in Nigeria. Um, this book was launched in February 2014. To a wider claim, uh, we printed over a thousand copies and we used um, a proper summary and letter of introduction to send it to more than 12 state governments where we knew um, some contacts, including the governor of the uh, Nassau State, who at that time, uh, is the current Senator Al Makura, who was the only top government official at that time that we knew who had a disability because he, he wears a hearing aid. Uh, response was not as we expected. But luckily, uh, within, I'd say, maybe about six months, we sent a copy to Mrs. Fashola, governor of Vegas at that time. And she read it, and she passed it to her husband. So out of the blues, we got a call on a Monday to say that we were supposed to see the governor on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. <laughs> and I remember it was like, how do I get my board together? But we called, uh, and to my surprise, out of 12 board members, 11 of them showed up at Alausa that day. And uh, Governor Fashola walked in, looking very tired and totally uninterested. And he said, I don't know who you people are. But somehow you got to my wife, and my wife has been disturbing me that I must see you. So please, go ahead. And I introduced members of my board. And as I introduced the members of our board, he was, he was taken aback by the quality of the people who are with me and my wife. And then I did a very reasonable presentation, if I can say that, with slides and so on. And at the end of the day, he just sat up and said, wow. This is fantastic. Um, you know, I'd love to give you people some money, but I don't have money to give you. But if you can come up with a training program for Lagos State Government, ah, we'll do that. And if you can, if you have it, if you can come up, put up a request for a piece of land, and then, uh, and then we'll get you a boss. And we walked away from that meeting surprised only to have five weeks later for the special advice on special education or something call us. And that's how we got our first boss from the Um, He asked us to send in a request for a piece of land, which we did. And uh, unfortunately, I think it was six months to change of government. So politics started and that request just died somewhere. But um, the 
chief of life staff, when I was able to brief him at that time on what Lagos were about to do, I said, no, 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 no. The Lagos state cannot come and steal you from us. And right there, he offered us a piece of land in Abuja on Bill Clinton Barracks, the Air Force Base. Um, so what did we do? We had to get the services of an architect, some experts. We put up a design for the NOLA's first center. And um, it was a very interesting project. In putting that center together, I learned a lot about the what was required in terms of design, in terms of access, in terms of water therapy, uh, name it. We did, we did just about everything that you could think about. It took quite some time. At the end of the day, we came up with the costings and um, we came up, you know, thinking about how to save costs. We came up with a two-story structure. Um, the two-story structure, when we showed it to the board, there are lots of people who looked at it that, first of all, Abuja is a prime property. Uh, it's a place where, um, you know, you could get a lot of attention and all that, and you could get a lot of, um, maybe you could say you could get a lot of uh, good quality rental space. So what did we do? They said, no, two stories was not enough. You had to go up and we had to go back to our architect and work on it, came up with another design. And finally, we had uh, an impressive design, which we now took to Abuja. We took to our friends. And we started to try to market this structure. Well, um, one thing led to another. And unfortunately, um, you know, the end of the tenure of that chief of air staff came. And the next chief of air staff was just not. Uh, interested in our project and it died. So Lagos State project died, um, Air Force project died. Uh, so we were stuck with our design. And so um, what we did was to say, okay, let me show you the, um, the design we came up with. The first um, image, which is the frontal view design. Um, this is like an aerial view with packing and so on. And quite interesting. So we continue to do our advocacy. We started a publication, which we wanted to do every quarter. And we started like 1000 copies of a magazine, all to do that. We started to do awareness walks. We started to reach out after about, um, I'd say four or five years. That is by 2017. A friend of mine who is a lawyer um, invited me over to, or what I do with people actually is that when you show a little bit of interest, I ask if you can give me time to tell you about the Benola vision. And when I told him about it in his office over a close to two hour session, uh, he said he'll see what he can do. And then uh, I think it was on a Friday. He suddenly called me and said he has an appointment to see the vice president on Monday. And would I like to go to Abuja with him? Because, you know, he would have 30 minutes and he will fit me in so I could use 10 minutes to talk to the vice president. Very interesting proposal. We went to Abuja. We saw the vice president. And he was very uh, receptive to the whole idea of the advocacy we're working on. Um, but he suggested that, look, I think the way you can help is if 
you can set up an event where I'll come, I'll speak. And at the end of the day, um, I'll deliver the keynote address. And hopefully that will bring a lot more awareness. There'll be good coverage and wow. So she, he gave us a special advisor. We started to work on it. This was from May. And we looked at our program. The only option was October. So we decided for October, they will have our first public lecture. Um, at the end of the day, the, uh, the special advisor who we were working with asked if we were at any project we were going to launch. That's, that's the best way that the vice president or his friends could support Benola financially. So we went back to the drawing board. And then we came up with a new design, something smaller, which would be built with water cabins, which could expand over time and so on, which we now call uh, Benalas Respite Center. Again, to be built over a plot of maybe four plots of land. Again, this took a lot of effort, brainstorming, and of course, some money to get all this design up to where it is. But at the end of the day, we, uh, this did not work. So on the day of the, I mean, the day to the event, uh, we got a call um, that the vice president would not be able to attend again. But, um, he sent in his uh, Minister of Edu Health, the Honorable Minister of Health. Through some friends, we got channels and some major media stations to cover it. We were at the Muson. We had close to 800 guests in attendance. It was Benola's finest hour. But subsequently, we had to come to the reality that um, everybody we meet they are either talking about we should collaborate with other uh, agencies that are in the field, or we should get a home where we could put 20, 30 children. And somehow, this mindset still continues to today. In fact, we have had people who ask, how many people are out there with CP? So we had to go out. It was during our workshop when we found no figures that we had to go in and do research and brainstorm and come up with a figure of 700,000 children and all people in Nigeria, several points, which every academic institution is now quoting. Then we had to go further and look into states. We started with Lagos State and we were able to pin the number down to at least 80,000 people in Lagos states living with several poles. So the figures are much lower for other states because it's it's a factor of the number or the population of the state. So with the highest population in Nigeria, definitely the highest number of people with several poles um, have to be in Lagos. We, based on this, we decided if people cannot see this, then we must find a way to bring these parents out. Uh, prior to this, we used to have our family forum in a hotel in Lekki. And some parents have complained that Lekki is too far and so on. But you see, the interesting thing is, if somebody says you should come to the mountain or the river or something for some miracle cure or to see some doctor, parents will go. But when you ask them to come to see you at a free event and so on, they start telling you about transport issues and problems. I remember a particular time when a physiotherapist, who is late now, um, told me that she could bring more than 40 people from Ikorodu, uh, but they had issues of transportation. So we sent her money based on her request. We were to start at 10 o'clock in Leggy. She didn't show up till 12.30, and she showed up with just two parents saying that many of them canceled at the last minute and so on. So these are just some of the frustrations that you get trying to run an NGO. So, but to try and show the world that there were a lot of people in Lagos, uh, we talked to our friends at Luth and they were able to get out of the facility. 
a, a hall, a very big hall of loot, uh, which could take a thousand people. And we said, okay, you know what? Put out an advert, 500 CP families. And as a way to encourage the families to come, we decided to give our CP wheelchairs. Um, and again, our friends came to our support. Some gave money. A few people gave out that right chairs. We were able to raise about 23 wheelchairs. And that was at the occasion of Laudu's 21st birthday. So we said, let's give out 21 wheelchairs, which we got. Now, this whole thing came together really interestingly. We had over 60 uh, specialists from do maybe resident doctors, physiotherapists, and all that. But we had well over uh, 350 CP families. Um, even some people with Down syndrome and autism were there. Total in the house that we fed, we gave T-shirts to all the consultants and all. We had well over 720 people in that hall that day. The media were there, everybody covered it, it was great. Uh, we did it for two more years. Uh, by 2019, you know, COVID had come in. I mean, so we couldn't do 2020, we couldn't do 2021. Um, we also, well, we thought about it. Okay, why don't we help our families? Right? So we did palliatives. We appealed for money to give out 20,000 to parents. Now, there's a problem. If you're going to give money to people, you need to be sure who you are dealing with. And so we asked parents to send their pictures of themselves and some details so that we could at least tell for sure who we're dealing with. Um, some parents didn't find it funny and they refused to play along. Um, even up till now, when we ask parents to show their children, at least for us to know who we're dealing with, it's still a problem. Um, but I'm glad to say that there are lots of parents who have come up. Uh, the period of COVID gave us an opportunity to do uh, an introspection, to do a proper review. Because you see, sometimes you can be so busy running and trying to help. Uh, we got to a stage with Lagos State where um, there was nothing that Lagos State Office of Disability did without consulting Benola, uh, without inviting us, without putting up. But you see, every time you have a change of government or administration, the sad thing is there's no proper handover. Even the staff in that office who know you or who know relationships, um, either they're unable to explain things to the new leadership or they also have their own issues. And you find that it's like you have to keep going back to knock on the door and start a relationship all over with a new administration. Um, so... Uh, it's not. It's not been easy. Yes, they're 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 interacting with parents. They're doing things with parents, um, but it's not the same. And it's and and parents complain whenever, let's say, the state government or the federal government wants to do something on disability. But if parents don't come together, either as groups or as single individuals standing, but creating a common front. Benola cannot continue to go and fight for people. You see, we don't really have parents per se. We don't run a school, we don't run a home. So we don't have a PTA per se. Uh, we have tried many times to get some parents to help coordinate the parents group, but it has always fallen through very sadly. Uh, so sometimes you have people say, oh, I'm part of Benola team. But it's like, how? You don't even go on Facebook to like what Benola posts. You are not doing anything per se on the Fenola group and so on. So we have kept going. We are rich here by a lot of um, a desire to keep the work going. Um, I can say now that there are times when I, I, I am honestly tired and um, thinking about giving up. But then um, I get an email or WhatsApp from a parent, and it is so encouraging. Uh, there are some people who will follow Benola for a couple of years before one day opening up to say, you know, actually, 
my life was about to fall apart four or five years ago when I had a Penola and I joined you. And it's sometimes I wonder, I said, then why did you say so right from the beginning? Okay. But whatever it is, it's important. And there are many parents who have an adult with CP, who have walked through Benola, who have been with Benola for as much as three to four years. Today, they are running their own programs on CP or something. There are lots of therapists that have come to see me personally, spent over an hour with me in my office getting free counseling because we don't charge for anything. But at the end of the day, they disappear only for you to see them on social media. They've started their own thing and everybody's struggling to stand. Well, I'd like to make it clear to you that um, running an NGO is tough. Nobody gives you money to rent for office to pay your rent. Nobody gives money to pay your staff. Nobody gives you money to even buy Panadol for yourself, so to speak. They will only support programs, programs that you plan to run and you do. And that's why um, NGOs have to show evidence of the programs that they're conducting. For instance, when we gave out palliatives, one time 200 families, one time 250 families, You'll be surprised that as many as 60 families did not even acknowledge the receipt of the money. Those who acknowledge when we say, okay, do something, they only send you the picture of the child, but the child is not the one that received the money. Okay. So, and even when we get those pictures, you now think, okay, how do I show accountability to our donors? Do I put pictures of the parents and their children? It is not fair. So again, you find that at the back end of the NGO, you are always struggling with issues, how to do this job and how to appear um, accountable to those who believe in you. But I'll say here that honestly, some of our friends have been so true to us um, that I must commend a few people, I'm talking about five or six people who have continued to give us without restraints about 10,000 naira every month. There are two of them who have done this since February 2013. So you can imagine how much they're giving Ben till today. But there are lots of people who continue to pray that you're doing a great job, the God, Lord will help you. And I'm wondering, um, is it that you don't realize that you are the one that God will use to help us? But we keep going. Um, as far as corporate organizations are concerned, I'm sorry to say that they're just in this thing for, um, for whatever little glory they can get out of it. You will see on TV where um, a big corporate organization will spend maybe 10,000 Naira to I mean, 10 million naira to put up a program just to celebrate somebody who has done something really wonderful. Uh, I remember when one bank gave uh, the, the first, the best overall student in medicine from the University of Nsuka, Nigeria. They gave her, I, can, I think it was 10,000 naira. A bank, that's just to show you Meanwhile, the MD and everybody flew, maybe they flew her to some, I don't know, Lagos or Abuja for this ceremony, or maybe in the university. But it's just to show you the mindset of people. A lot of corporate organizations will go to your home or school. What they want to do is to paint the home or school in their own corporate colors or do some renovation in terms of their corporate color. Um, I can't tell you the number of corporate organizations that have called me from time to time, maybe because somebody told them about Benola. And they always want to know how many children do you have? And when I tell them that, no, we don't have children, the next thing is, oh, so what are you doing? And I always say, do you have 10 minutes? And if they say yes, then I try to tell them about the Benola issue. At the end of the day, most of them will say, wow, that is awesome. Well done. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't fit into our CSR. Because the CSR is about identifying a home or a school, going there, giving something out, taking pictures, which they will now put in their year, I mean, end of year report as to uh, what they're doing. At the end of the day, like I said, um, it's difficult. It's really difficult. Government is yet to get the message. Corporate organizations are yet to get the message as to how to help and support people. Um, but it's not going to happen unless we come together as a formidable force. Uh, if we say we want to do something like a walk or et cetera, if we can, if we say there are 80,000 people in Lagos living with cerebral palsy, and we cannot even put together a hundred people, is it that the rest of them do not believe that there is need for advocacy? But if you see the emails and the WhatsApp messages we receive in Benola, it is amazing. Some of them, you read them and you cannot sleep that night because people have issues with accommodation, they have issues with medication, they have issues with therapy. Um, a lot of women ha have issues with their husbands. And you say, okay, can you come to the office and let's have a talk? Because the most difficult thing to do is to do consultation or, or counseling with somebody you cannot see. Doing counseling over the phone is a, it's like a thankless job. I will tell you that from my experience, I've spoken to lots of people. A woman is having problems with her husband. You spend an hour plus talking to her. Then she says, sir, can you please call my husband and maybe talk to him? She gives you his number, you call, and they're usually very, very rude. It's like, who gave you my number? <laughs> and most of them are young people. At my age, it's like, hey, I'm trying to help you, uh, and so on. But over time, you realize that the best thing is, can you guys come to the office, or you alone come to the office? And many people set up an appointment. On the day of the appointment, you don't see them. You don't hear from them. Even when you call me, I, I have stopped receiving, uh, attending to people with CP on Saturday and Sunday. I need to get some rest. I need to sort out my own family. I have my own son who is going to be 27 this June, who has more issues than all the people who are calling me to talk about their children. So, and I say, okay, call me on Monday between 10 and 2 o'clock or so on. And guess what? They'll call me at 7.30, 8 o'clock on Monday. And when I ask, why are you just calling me now? So I was so busy during the day. And it's like, I walk like crazy, my wife will tell you, from morning till 5 o'clock on the CP issues. Um... So I've learned to also take a break and give myself a bit of rest. So if something is not, is not bothering you enough to take off time during a decent working hour to try and resolve it or something, then I don't think it's that serious. You see, we have learned over the years that cerebral palsy um, it's not dangerous, it's not contagious, it's not infectious. It is not something that uh, should give you sleepless nights. Yes, you see, if your child has seizures, if your child is running temperature, if your child has issues with bowel movement, Benola cannot help with that. It's a medical facility near you that will help that evening or that night. And then maybe they'll refer you to a better place for better management after that. So that's not what should be an emergency for you to call in me at 11 or 12, like some people do. There are those who send a message, email or WhatsApp. And to be honest, they're very rude. There's no introduction of who you are. There's no introduction of where you're calling from. It's just, good evening. My name is Sean. I mean, my I have a seven-year-old chat with cerebral palsy boy or girl, 
what can you do for us? <laughs> you know, it's like, um, there's a lot I could do, but if you are a little bit more polite, uh, I think we could connect better. Um, in the first, I'll say maybe in the first seven years of running Benola, I printed, I gave out, I must have given out over 3,000 of my complimentary cards. I used to have complimentary cards. In the last two years, I no longer go out and buy complimentary cards. And the reason is simple. It's not that I'm ashamed of Benola. Many people know me now as Benola boss, so it, it, that's not the issue. But the point is, I, I can't recall anybody that I gave my card that really called me up or went to check Benola's website to really understand what we do. But you know what they do? Anytime they see somebody with a child with cerebral palsy, they give them the card. These people will help you. <laughs> and so you get calls, someone say, ah, someone give me your card. They say, you can help us. So the person who is passing on my card has not even taken time to understand what I do. And so by handing out my number, or stuff like that, you're actually creating stress for me. So I, 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 I want to appeal to people to understand these things, that every one of us can do a lot. Every one of us can do advocacy in our own special way. Some of us who are much younger than me, especially the our mothers who are, um, whose children are under 10 years old, can actually start a daycare center for children about their age. I mean, their child's age. It's so easy to use a room in your house to start off with four or five children by word of mouth along the neighborhood. And the next thing you know, you are getting better understanding of CP. You have one or two nannies to take care of these children. Those parents who are bringing the children are paying for the daycare services. And you are suddenly fulfilled in the sense that you are doing something you love and you're getting paid. Because, because there are some parents who really want to go back to work, especially the professional ones. And those ones are looking for a good place to put their child. And maybe some of the options that are available now are not up to their standard. So that's where it is. From my interaction with most of the homes and schools in Lagos alone, in Abuja, in, in Jos and all, you'll be amazed that, you know, at the fees some of the schools are charging and the fees some parents are willing to pay. So please don't allow the fact that you have a child with a disability become your problem. And um, those who are on social media, please be mindful of the kind of, um, videos and pictures that you post. Um, I think it is helpful for you and everybody else that you post positive pictures of your children. If you want to make a point about the fact that child is having maybe some um, specialist equipment fitted or going through a particular type of physio, it's all right. But our videos now are filled of instance videos of children crying while doing therapy. It's not supposed to be like that. Um, because you see, not every physiotherapist can handle a little child. Just like not every nurse or every doctor can handle a baby. There are specially strained for these people. And those who are not that specially strained can actually harm the child while they're trying to you see, when somebody is trying to straighten a crooked leg, that it can never be. It, you are just going to create more pain and possibly break the bone of the child in the process. So I want us to uh, get to understand exactly what it is we're trying to do and the fact that we're trying to encourage other parents. That's why we have our CP uh, family WhatsApp page where we encourage people to just say something, tell some stories. I can see some people here who tell wonderful stories on their pages, but they never share it on our own CP page. 
I don't understand why. Okay. And I, I also see a lot of people who uh, come to CP Thursday to tell wonderful story, stories about their children. And there are days I finish and I'm asking, so what's your problem? If your child can do this, do that, do everything and so on, it's like, uh, then what are, what's your problem? Because you see, we're having, I, 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 I'm sorry to say this, but CP for some people is a very serious issue. That's why I've had to come a few times to share my own story. For you parents to understand what we are going through in my home. And we still find time to encourage other people. So please, don't discourage people with more serious issues from coming out because we're not seeing those serious issues on CP Thursday. And I, I personally feel that some people are feeling bad about it, okay? So let us um, tell our story, fine, but it's not so much about what your child can do now. It's about how your life has been affected positively, how you have been able to cope with certain things and so on. So um, I'd like to end this by saying 10 years of running an NGO with cerebral palsy has been very good for 10 years. Um, it has been very stressful. Unfortunately, the stress has come from lack of funding, lack of, um, like I say, support from even the parents. When I say support, I'm not saying that parents should give them all that money, but I'm saying parents, um, you cannot say you are part of Benola and you are not following Benola on social media. And you are not encouraging Benola. By, I, 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 in fact, I, I decided, some of you might have noticed that in the last couple of years, we have tried to put a lot of Benola messages on my family pictures, either me and Laudu, him and his brothers, my wife and Laudu, and so on. Because most of the things that we spend so vital hours researching and finding, whether it's those t-shirts about I'm a CP mom, I'm a this. After, once we put them on social media, there are individuals who just immediately repost them without giving credit to Benola. And um, so we do the work. We have all the information on our website, which by the way is, uh, is a very interesting place for you to go and learn about cerebral palsy. Um, our social media pages, we try to put a lot of information there. But some people don't even do the homework and they pick it and they put it on their pages and they don't even give credit. They don't even say hello to their knowledge. But you see, there's a way you write that if somebody reposts it, you can tell that this is my post that this person has put out there and so on. So let us be more friendly to each other. Let's support each other. Let's look out for people with CP in our neighborhood who we can reach out to. And finally, for our Benola parents, if somebody is going through an issue that you know, we need to figure out what can we as a body do to help. It could be each of us just bringing our 500 naira, And we've done it before in the past, but in the last two years, I'm not seeing it happen. And it's because nobody amongst the parents wants to take on that leadership role. Benola cannot lead you as a group. Benola is doing its own work with the little staff that we're able to keep. You as parents should be able to bring yourself together as another group too that will begin to see how uh, with Benola support. In the past, every time the families have been able to bring to get us later some resources to help somebody who is going through a problem. Benola has always contributed substantially to the total package, but the money is not given by Benola, it's given by the parents. So please, let's not um, allow that spirit to die. And especially for young people or new people who are coming on the group, um, they're looking to see what kind of encouragement they'll get and so on. 
I was very happy with the parents who contributed last Thursday at the Be Parents. Um, they were very positive, and I hope that I will see more of that. So uh, meanwhile, I'll use this opportunity to thank you all once again, to wish you the very best on this. I always like to stress American uh, Cerebral Policy Awareness Day, because the world is yet to come up with a date. What we do in October is just an online awareness mm -hmm. organized by uh, a disability group in, in Australia. The UN is yet to come up with a day. Nigeria is yet to come up with a day officially. It will have to be recognized by either a state or this or that for us to now say, yes, we are adopting 25th of March or we are adopting 6th of October. But hey, there's nothing wrong with us celebrating both days. And any other day that comes up, as you are aware, uh, we celebrate Mother's Day twice in Nigeria. Some countries celebrate it four or five times and so on. So every day that we can celebrate cerebral palsy is a day in which we can be reminded to look at our children and thank God for who they are. And if you haven't yet found the answer, to ask God to show you why he selected you to be a parent to this very interesting individual. And I'm sure that you'll give it an answer. Thank you very much. And Enjoy the rest of your evening.